Here is, on page 20, uh, textual changes over against the Nestle All-In 28 edition. Right here. And there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33. Out of the entire... So that's what? Two per chapter, maybe? Um, that does not mean that when the Nestle on 29th edition comes out, that the old readings will have disappeared, uh, you won't be able to see them anymore. In reality, um, in the ECM, you'll have more information about what manuscripts contain what readings than you've ever had before. Fuller collations, fuller amounts of information available to you. Now, for a lot of people, that's scary. It's uh, having all that information is frightening to people whose text is derived not from God preserving manuscripts over time, but from tradition. So if you're King James only, if you're TR only, this is bad news. Or minimally irrelevant. So here is, here is provision, I think very gracious provision, I mean, Islam has nothing even close to this. Islam doesn't have anything close to this, let alone this. Um, here is provision of a tremendous amount of information, documentation, concerning the readings of the New Testament and the faithfulness of the scribes in their copying uh, over the centuries. But for a lot of people... It's just bad news. It's just bad news. It should just be bad news for atheists and people who want to try to say we don't have any idea what the original New Testament said. And this represents the application of CBGM, Coherence-Based Genealogical Methodology, um, which is um, allowing computers feeding into a computer the collation of many manuscripts, best manuscripts that we have, and I don't mean that in the sense of just a few, huge numbers of manuscripts, and then allowing the computer to recognize relationships and patterns between manuscripts that a human mind would not be able to see. We can only keep, you know, I, I watched... Um, uh, Fahrenheit 451, the 2018 edition on HBO again recently while riding a couple days ago. And uh, I do recommend it to you. It has uh, Michael B. Jordan in it, who seems to be a real big popular guy these days. Um, he did a good job, I thought, in acting it. But point was, it seemed even creepier today than it did when I watched it about nine months ago. That's how much farther into that world we've gone. Oh, I see that you see the, uh, did you pull it out so it could be seen? This. That's how it normally looks? Okay. Yeah, we're going to, Rich just got me this thing. See, I'm being distracted. Rich just got me this thing here. Um, we're not using it right now, but I'm going to be on um, the Church Split. It was Church Split uh, webcast right after this program, and I'll be using this. And uh, let's just be honest, you... Uh, you stole it from uh, from Nathan. Yeah. So there you go, Nathan. Um, Rich Rich saw it, said it sounded real good, and uh, boom. Um, now I have to now I have to take it um, on my road trips. That's that's the whole point. Um, I'm not sure if I'll be using it. And here, there's a see. I'm looking at a camera right now. Right above it literally sitting on its lens is another camera which i use for doing webcasts like the interview this afternoon and so that plus this now that has pretty good sound on it so no one's ever complained but now 
I'll use this today, test it out, and then it's going to get stuck in in the mobile AO mobile command center. And uh, so I just saw it sitting there going, oh, okay, that's interesting. Anyways, what was I talking about? Um, point is, um, the I was going to admit an error on my part. I have said for a couple of years that I expected when a mark came out that finally there would be much more mainstream discussion of CBGM, which scares me on one hand because uh, even Christian media is not up to at all accurately representing what CBGM is all about. There aren't that many people who understand what CBGM is all about. There just aren't. Um, it's, it's very mysterious to a lot of people. And um, so I was wrong. Not that, I mean, these are just now coming out. So something still could come around. But here's the point. Um, there aren't, Mark just doesn't have that, doesn't have the real pop textual variants. The ones that will catch attention. John does. So John 118, really important uh, textual variant. Uh, really interested in seeing how that goes as far as CBGM goes. The CBGM databases. Um, I think I think once John comes out, then finally that will probably happen then. But looking over um, these variations, these changes. Um, well, it's interesting. The very last one in Mark 16, 19 um <laughs> most of the, most of them uh for those of you who there's a lot of background on this stuff okay and um a couple of years ago I spent a lot of time on the program going over a lot of that background uh it's been a little while mainly because there weren't any real new developments in it for about 2 years now but um one of the interesting aspects of this is that for years and years and years and years, we utilized language such as the Byzantine text type, the Alexandrian text type, Western text type, Caesarean text type, so on and so forth, in talking about New Testament textual history, variations, variants, and things like that. Um, the analysis by CBGM has basically said there's only so far, and I don't see that Mark is changing any of that, um, only so far one really identifiable homogenous group, and it's a Byzantine manuscripts. There really isn't an Alexandrian text type or a Western text type. Uh, and people had already been going, there is no Caesarean text type for a long time, so that wasn't anything new. What's interesting is, um, as I look at this list, the large majority of them are a movement toward the Byzantine text type. Now, there's only, a, it's still a small handful. But there are a couple away from it. And the last one is Mark 16, 19. Uh, the NA28 had a Byzantine reading of Lord Jesus, and now the ECM simply has Lord. Um, but the rest are toward a Byzantine reading. And the one reading that I had said would really be interesting, and I did mention this last week because I looked it up online because the online stuff is available. I suppose I should silence that. Um, the online stuff is available, is Mark 1.1. And those of you who, for example, sort of algo my debates, uh, would know that Mark 1-1 came up in my debate with Shabir Ali in 2006. And the question is, how does the verse end? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the Son of God there or not? It's in brackets in the NA28. It's no longer in brackets in the ECM. So in 29, that's not in 29, it won't be in brackets. So the CB... GM analysis of the coherence of the manuscripts strengthened the editor's conclusion that Son of God was original. Now, that's fascinating 
because there had been all sorts of discussion about what that would have looked like in the original language because it's a string of genitives and they would have been what's called nomina sacra, the, the sacred names. And so that whole string of abbreviated words, a lot of people had said, eh, yeah, you know, that, that could cause confusion and could cause a copyist to maybe skip over things. And that's basically what ECM is saying is that the evidence is that the copyist skipped over it, but it was original, is basically what, what's being said. But that's considered a move toward the Byzantine um, textual tradition. But again, very small number, very, very small number. And until you get some, and we may not get real, it, it's really sort of in Paul that I think there's going to be, at least for New Testament scholars, some real questions uh, about how CBGM is going to fall out on these things. And it's, again, it, it's not just because CBGM says it uh, that they come to that conclusion, but there's Mark and it's out. And um, I am hoping, I haven't totally confirmed this yet, but I'm hoping that a Grace Bible Seminary and then maybe again after G3 on the way home uh, in uh, Tyler, Texas, I may get the opportunity uh, to um, do some lecturing on CBGM, just introductory level stuff, because especially if you are taking seminary level classes and you have an interest in textual criticism and most people in this audience at least can survive a discussion of textual criticism, or you wouldn't be watching this program anyways. Um, or especially if you've read the King James Only Controversy, you already have an interest in it. Um, anybody today, you're, you're going to be left behind as, as far as, not eschatologically, <laughs> you're going to be le <laughs> left behind um, in the New Testament realm if you're not aware of CBGM and what's what's being done and what the goal is and what the process is going to be and how once all of ECM is done, that doesn't mean everything stops. Uh, probably it means that there's uh, a revision past that. And the traditionalists say, there's your problem. You never come to a final text. And I say to the traditionalists, there's your problem. You don't have any respect for the original text. Um, you, you've given up the work. Because stuff is being found all the time, and that's a wonderful thing. It's a good thing. It's a positive thing. It is great. We have so much more of the New Testament available to us today than we had in the 16th century. And I think it's just absolute insanity uh, to promote the idea that we should somehow uh, limit ourselves as to the availability of information to defend the text of the New Testament. And... Um, so again, as one who believes that this has value long down the road, and as one who has now at least a consistent eschatology to want to do things long down the road, um, I think it's fantastic, it's exciting. And uh, what they're doing now, and I'm not sure if they've gone back and done it with the older stuff, but uh, I know with the Gospel of Mark, you can actually now download the databases to your own computer and uh, I've actually uh, reached out to someone. I hopefully will get some training because I'm going to tell you something. Coming into the study of ECM, CBGM, from years of studying textual criticism, it's exciting. But when I was studying textual criticism in the 1980s, we didn't have computers. <laughs> okay, you know, we didn't we didn't have uh, databases and stuff like that to be drawing from. Uh, and so downloading stuff and literally doing things in various languages to get it to do stuff wasn't part of my training. Uh, so there are others who have been trained in those areas that um, we will avail ourselves of uh, to get to learn some more things. But all that to say that uh, that is exciting. It's positive. It's um, 
it's a good thing. And I think sometimes we just get so focused on all the bad news that we think it's only news if it's bad. It's only news if it makes you angry. If it is a positive thing, a positive thing that will assist and aid in the uh, defense of the gospel, in the translation of scriptures, uh, that type of thing. That's almost like a ho-hum yawner these days. 